Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is a fantastic summer camp horror by the wonderful mind of Wanahi. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story, entitled Camp Wanahi, Part 3. Let's get straight into that. Hey everyone, Carl here. And there hadn't been much to tell you about lately since I've been out on bed rest while my foot heals. And that is until a couple of days ago when shit hit the fan. I'm going to have to skip the whole new fact thing this time. There's just too much to happen today. Things have started to get really weird. I know that doesn't mean much since this place is weird to begin with, but things have just gone completely sideways now. It's kind of hard to explain, but I'll try my best. I've had to stay off my foot for a few days, which gave me time to fashion a makeshift crutch. It's essentially a big branch that Maria found for me, with a Y shape at the end to put my armpit in. And I cushioned it with some old rags and it has worked well so far. Well, don't get me wrong, I'm used to solitude, but hearing all the kids and counsellors out and about having fun with our activities while I stayed inside well, was driving me a little crazy. Well, I should say I had been completely alone since Maria came by to check on me, bring me food and chat with me. Even John McCain stopped by a couple of times, but he doesn't talk much. Maria was very proud of having talked to him about not bringing us more dead animals. Now, he did stop and she is still alive, meaning I was wrong, and I have to give her credit for her plan working. Anyway, I was incredibly surprised one day when I woke up from one of my moonshine-induced stupors. Well, seriously, that stuff has to have something other than alcohol in it to find Enola sitting by my bed. She was chatting softly with another person, and I was having a hard time focusing since I was still a little inebriated. She turned and smiled at me, wrinkles forming at the edges of her dark brown eyes. Hey Carl, we heard that you'd had an accident and came to see how you were doing. Oh, I said as I patted her hand. That's so nice of you. It's good to know that there are friends like you around who are just looking out for people like me. Of course, and we also brought you some herbal medicines that will help with the pain. You should probably not continue to drink the moonshine. It'll probably kill you far quicker than any infection. And she sat her leather satchel on my bed. I've written instructions on how to use them so you don't end up dying or tripping balls. I nodded and I picked up the satchel. Oh, that's smart. You're smart, Enola, I said as I opened the satchel and was hit with a variety of strong herbal scents, which made me almost immediately dizzy. I resealed the satchel and sat it on my bedside table. I really appreciate that. So, how have you been? I've been doing all right, living life one day at a time. Pretty boring stuff. I nodded. Well, that's good. Doing better than me. I said as I lifted my foot. Uh, by the way, have you run into the thing that may have escaped from the doorway? The smile dropped from her face. Well, that's the real reason why we're here, Carl. I haven't seen anything new in the woods, but things feel off around here. Also, my great aunt Maida had a vision and she insisted that she come and see you. And she gestured towards the foot of my bed. I turned to find a very old woman sitting at the end of her bed. Her hair was silvery white and braided down her back while her face had so many age lines that they piled up on top of each other. Her hands were gnarled and held an old walking stick and with the head of a wolf engraved on the top. Its sharper edges and lines haven't been smoothed and worn away over many years of use. This woman was old. So old she made Coot look young. Maida said nothing 
as she stood on shaky legs. I watched as her eyes rolled into the back of her head and as they whitened. Is this normal? I asked. It not a shush me as Maida took a long, wheezing inhale and began speaking in a raspy voice, layered on top of many, many others. With blood to spill and hunger satiates, doors have opened and fear awakes. Demons walk this place askew, and with them terror made new. The mother lets her children play, on this earth they wish to stay. The one who traveled far from here, visiting places, t'would be wise to veer. Doors once hid now reappear, your danger grows ever near. With ways now open, they seek revenge. The world's fate stands upon the ledge. There was a long silence. I would say but is he a minute before the old woman tilted her head to the side. Questions? I'm sorry, I asked. Do you have any questions? She repeated in a wave of voices. Oh, I didn't think that's how this stuff worked. I thought you just gave me an ambiguous warning about something and just left me to try and figure things out. I turned to Bonola. Oh, that's very considerate of all of you. Dude, Enola said, gesturing to her great aunt. Oh, right. I thought for a second. Why did you receive a warning that was a basic rhyme poem? What? The many voices of Maida asked. I mean, it sounded okay, but it sounded like something a high school kid would write for their Dungeons and Dragons game. Just seems out of place. Hey, you know what? Fuck this guy. A mal voice said from Maida. He was joined by a chorus of other voices. I was very off-putting since she didn't move her mouth anymore, with the voices pouring out insults and curses over each other. And there was one last voice, sounded like a little girl, who said, I hope he gets the clap, and then made her close her mouth and fell back into the chair. Whoa, that last one was, hmm, not okay, I said, squirming a little. Enola punched me hard in the arm. What the hell, Carl? Ow! I cried, rubbing my arm. What? It was a legitimate question. Those were my ancestors. They worked really hard on that to tell you something important, in a way your dumbass would understand. I felt a hard, sharp impact on my skin, and I cried out and turned to see the old woman holding her stick in her hands and the most sour look on her wrinkled face. I hadn't seen her move. Okay, okay, I get it. I messed up. Well, can we bring them back? No, Maida yelled in a raspy voice. You are an ungrateful child. It will serve you right if you get eaten. Enola, let's go. Wait, what did it mean about that person that travelled from here and opened the doors? I asked looking between Enola and her great-aunt as they both got up. I have no idea, boy, Maida said as she slowly walked from the room. Figure it out. I did my job, and I'm going home. The rest of that day was soured by the interaction. And this is a good example of why I don't drink very often. It tends to cloud my better judgment, and I can't be insulting someone's ancestors when they're trying to help me out. It sets a bad precedent. This job is hard, and I need all the help I can get. And thankfully, Enola slipped me a written version of the poem before she left. I guess Maida had shared it with her before she came here. And after a few hours of looking over it and trying to find anything in a CWAP, unsuccessfully, I still didn't know what it was talking about. I tried to write to take my mind off of things. Currently working on a romance novel between a female vampire and a merman in future Tokyo. Even though I tried, I just couldn't get my mind off of what Enola had said and the warning from her ancestors. 
I decided to go for a hobble to find Maria, and despite her telling me to keep resting. The crotch was awkward and a little unwieldy at times, but I got the job done. It was approaching dinner time, and I found Maria with a bunch of campers at the archery range. Thought I told you to stay back in your cabin, Maria said as I came up beside her. Yeah, but I was going stir crazy and needed to get out. I said as I watched the kids attempt to hit various targets. We had your traditional round straw targets, one that looked like an elk and a handful that looked like various other creatures from around the woods. It helped to know who you could trust to make a shot with a bow when it counted, and we didn't have many promising archers in this group. Hmm, she said as she surveyed the kids. So, who were the women that visited you today? i never seen them. Johnny, don't point that at Erica. I heard two of the boys muttering as they began firing at the targets again. A uh, long story. Enola, the younger woman, is a regular around the woods and camp. Uh, she visits somewhat regularly, but she doesn't like being seen, so she tends to sneak around. Enola is really chill, and uh, she could turn into a massive black fox. Well, how big is massive? Uh, about eight feet long. But two of that is her tail, and four feet tall, I replied, showing her the height with my free hand. Maria nodded. Yeah, that's pretty massive. Uh, what about the older woman? Well, that's her great aunt, apparently, I said with a sigh. I hadn't met her before today, and apparently she received a message from their ancestors that she needed to give to me, uh, some sort of warning. Oh, really? Well, that sounds exciting. I shrugged and took the paper with the poem out of my pocket and handed it to her. I guess I kind of insulted her and her ancestors, and so they all don't like me now. Maria took the paper with a raised eyebrow. How did you insult them? I told them that I didn't think the wording and style of the warning was very impressive. Thought it was kind of a cliché. Wow, are you serious? You said that to someone's supernatural ancestors? Maria asked as she began reading the poem. Your ass is getting haunted. Well, it's surprising that I haven't been haunted already. Or maybe I have. The opposite problem of this kid from the sixth sense. It will make it hard for anyone to haunt me if I couldn't see them. I watched as a girl tried to shoot two arrows at a time, only to have them flip wildly through the air for a couple of feet before hitting the ground. Her friends laughed at her. Well, that sounds ominous, Maria said as she handed the paper back to me. Do you know what it's talking about? I have no idea, I replied as I put the paper back into my pocket. I'm going to go talk with some of the locals and see if I can figure anything out tomorrow. Maria looked at her watch and told all the kids to gather the equipment and put it away before they got ready for the nightly fire. I suppose that's a good idea. Uh, let me know how it goes. Hmm. Oh, will do, I said as I adjusted my crutch to get moving again. Oh, what's for din- The question died in my throat as I heard a muffled scream from the woods. I looked across the clearing to see a skeletal and sickly pale woman, one with no face lurching on the periphery of the woods. The kids all stopped and stared at the faceless, the first time that they had ever seen her. Oh, that's not right, I whispered to Maria. I felt glued to the spot as a cold sweat covered my body. She's never been out in the day. Come on, kids, we need to go, Maria said as she began to quickly gather them up. Leave everything and don't make a sound. We'll be all right. I shook myself out of my stupor and began limping as quickly as possible with the kids. Glancing behind me, I saw that the faceless had made her way into the clearing. Luckily, she hadn't reacted to our presence. However, she wasn't wandering around aimlessly. She appeared to have focused on something. In the now quiet of our surroundings, I could hear faint cheering and yelling in the direction that she was going. I moved up to one of the kids closest to me, a boy, I would guess around 14, with brown curly hair and a noticeable sunburn on his face. Hey, I whispered. Where were the rest of the campers and counselors? Huh? 
Uh, they're playing kickball on the other side of the camp, I think, he said as quietly as he could, moving his mouth as little as possible. Uh, some others might have gone to the lake, but I'm not sure. At that moment, I knew I had to do something stupid. You see, the faceless was going in the direction of the kickball fields. The games were loud and it was likely they hadn't heard the screams, nor would they before it was too late. Run to Maria and tell her to get all of you inside, then get all of the other campers and counselors inside. Tell her not to come after me. I know what I'm doing. I will see them in the morning at the latest. If they don't see me, tell them to keep the camp safe and that Maria is in charge. You got all of that? The boy nodded and began to jog as quietly as he could to where Maria was walking at the front of the line. I began hobbling towards the faceless. I saw the kid get to Maria and deliver my message. She immediately turned to me with a look of horror. She looked like she was about to say something, but I just shook my head and screamed, Hey, bitch! Come get dinner! The faceless immediately turned my direction and began moving my way. And since I was only about a hundred yards away from her, I began limping to the tree line, which wasn't too difficult, but slower than I would have liked. Once within the forest, I slowed down more, since I had to start choosing my steps and crotch placement as carefully as I could. I was now living a scenario I have run away from too many times in my head. It was a common thought experiment of mine. And there were two things to keep in mind. If I was too quiet, the faceless would lose interest in me, or if there was something else that she heard instead. On the other hand, if I made a sound at the wrong time, specifically when she was too close, it would mean death. In those scenarios, I had imagined having full use of my body, and so this was a hell of a lot harder. If I lost my footing or stumbled, I wouldn't be able to get back up in enough time to put distance between us again. And out of all the ways I would want to go out, being eaten was not at the top of my list. All of that being said, luck appeared to be on my side. My tactics had been working perfectly. A rock knocked over here, the rustling of a branch there, followed by silent movement. I had managed to keep her interested for quite some time, easily half of a mile. I knew that by this point the campers would be safe. Now I had to figure out how to get her off of my own tail. And that's when the crutch slipped on a rock as I was making my way downhill. I cried out as it sent me toppling forward and rolling down the incline dozens of yards. I smacked my head on something so hard that my vision flared white, and I felt my injured foot hit squarely on a rock or two. The pain seared through my foot, burning a path up my nerves, which might have been the only thing that kept me conscious. I was brought to an abrupt stop when I rolled into a tree, the impact of which against my back knocking the wind out of me. I wanted to scream from the pain in my foot, but managed to hold it in enough to be very anguished, which was more than I thought I would be able to accomplish. I heard the faceless getting closer, her screams growing louder, and with that much sound I had chummed up the proverbial waters. She was crashing through the bushes and branches in my direction. I looked around desperately for the crutch, hoping if it was close enough that I could get up and put more distance between us. I couldn't find it. It was now lost in the underbrush somewhere further up the hill. I instead, I began looking for anything else around me. A branch, a rock, anything I could use to maybe distract her. I searched desperately, and her screams got louder with every moment. And then I saw her coming down the hill, moving with a predator's grace. Though blind, she never hit into anything. I knew my search was pointless now. I would simply alert her before I found distraction and be dead anyways. Instead, I grabbed the Leatherman from my pocket and flipped open the knife. I wasn't going to be eaten without a fight. I knew almost certainly I couldn't kill her, but I was going to try. I held my tiny weapon ready to make the last stand as she ran at me. 
and the faceless was almost on top of me when she stopped stone still. She was only five feet away at the most. Her head turned from side to side, making no noise. The faceless was listening for me. She didn't know exactly where I was, didn't know I was right in front of her. She was waiting for me to give the next hint of where I had gone. I had a possible chance, but I couldn't think of what to do. My brain had stopped working as I looked at her. I've seen the faceless many times, but I had never seen her this close. At any time, it would have been absolutely terrifying. In the light of day, it was exponentially worse. We expect monsters to exist at night and in the dark, and that's why we run from the basement when we turn off the lights or hesitate to leave the safety of our beds in the middle of the night. This day is safe though. It's always been safe, even at Camp Wanahi. Now that was gone. I was before her now, a living nightmare in the light of day. All I had was a tiny knife. I was at her mercy. And in the light of the afternoon sun, I could see every bit of the horror that I was up against. The skin was stretched so tight and thin that I could see the veins and muscles moving beneath it. While she had eyes, I could see them moving underneath the skin as well, flicking and jumping violently in a pointless attempt to see anything. I could see her stomach. A thick line running up it looked puckered, like a poorly stitched wound that had healed into a disfiguring scar. I saw that line twitch, and my breath, as little as I was breathing, in an attempt to be quiet, caught. All at once, I saw her skeletal torso expanding as the true mouth of the faceless opened. Her waist grew several times its width. I heard her ribs pop and her sternum snap as they separated to reveal a gaping orifice with teeth and jutting bones yellowed with age. The smell of the rot and the death that emerged from it made me want to wretch. The grey tongue slid out from the bottom of the mouth, extending several feet towards me. It dripped a viscous fluid and squelched as it moved. It was grey and tube-like, more like a tentacle with a glossy smooth surface. It flicked around like a snake tasting the air, and then she started walking into my direction. I gripped the knife tighter. This was it. I was going to be eaten by this creature, this nightmare that day could no longer hold at bay. I came within two feet of me where its tongue hit the tree. She diverted around the tree and me, and the faceless was walking slowly to make it as little noise as possible. I watched as she used the tongue as a probing cane so she could find her way through the trees without making any noise. I saw her stop again, only a few yards away, and I instinctively held my breath as she began listening more carefully. This process repeated again and again as she moved away from me. Thinking I was in the clear, I rolled over onto my stomach and began to crawl away as quietly as I could. I hadn't gone more than a few yards when I heard screeching. I turned, expecting to see the faceless running at me, fearing that I had somehow made enough noise for her to hear. Instead, I saw something that managed to be worse and lucky at the same time. It was large and humanoid, its flesh marbled crimson and yellow, looking like a cross-section of a body's fat and muscles. It had an oval head with bulging pale yellow eyes, attached to a neck that was too long. The neck opened up horizontally like a Pez dispenser to reveal the mouth of a demonic lamprey, which let out another curdling scream. Its fleshy tentacle-like arms ended with bony nodules that had long wicked spikes. I knew this abomination had to be the one that escaped the door Maria and I had closed. It felt too similar. It was wrong in the same way as the other creature had been. Then they were fighting. The large and brutish newcomer attacking the much more nimble faceless. They were attacking each other like wild animals. Their urge to kill each other became a need that was all-consuming. This was it, my chance to escape. 
I stood up, ignoring the pain that was coming from my foot, and began running. I could feel the stitches pop as I continued, one after another. I felt blood flowing freely, and the pain was making my head swim, but I had to get away. I had to run in the direction of the camp. I had to get back. I had to escape the horrors that now roamed the day. I had to get to safety. I had to get to Wanahi. It began to become difficult, though. I was beginning to lose blood a lot quicker than I thought, and my head was swimming from what I believed was possible concussion. I had to make sure I ran back to Wanahi, back the way I had come. I had to run straight. If I strayed in my state, I would likely get lost. I had to get away. I had to get away from the screams, needed to hear them fade. But they followed me. I could hear the screaming. I heard it changing. The screaming that would wake me up some nights. I could hear her voice. The voice of a girl being attacked. The voice of a girl that I couldn't save. The voice of a girl I had to leave. I didn't look back. I feared she would actually be there this time. The ghost that did haunt my dreams and my memories. She's not here. She's not here. She's gone. She's been gone for years. I thought as my lungs burned and my foot screamed for me to stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. She may be gone, but she may not be. And don't let her catch you. You will deserve what she does to you. Don't stop. She's not here. Don't stop. Don't let her catch you. I ran and I ran. I ran straight, hoping that I hadn't been turned around at some point. I ran, delirious with fear and increasing blood loss, and I ran for hours, a nightmare I couldn't wake up from. I could have sworn that the sun had gone down and all was darkness around me. I ran past a door and thought about going inside out of desperation to escape. I just kept running. I just kept hearing the screaming. Please, Carl, help me. Don't stop. Keep running. She's not there. Don't let her get you. I continued. I continued day after day. I continued after my feet wore away and I was running on bare bones, wearing away. My lungs no longer functioned as I could feel myself suffocating, but I kept going. I passed many doors, some colourful, some dark, wood, metal, square, round, and many in between. Why are there so many doors? I thought through the haze of my confusion. I was ripped from the thought by her screams, and they were getting louder. I could hear her footsteps getting closer too. I was losing ground. I heard her screaming turn from a sorrowful pleading to angry accusations. You left me, Carl West. You left me out here. You coward. You fool. You monster. You belong out here with us, with the monsters. That's why you are at Wanahi. That's why you don't forget like the rest. You're a monster like the rest of us. You can't leave. You won't leave. I felt a hand grabbing at me, tugging at my clothes. So many hands. The screaming was deafening. The trees started to thin. I saw the clearing. I saw the buildings. I ran desperately and my body begging to give out. You can't leave, Carl. You can't run from me. I felt her hands grab me, find him purchase. First one, and then another, and then three more. All of them pulled me back into the depths of the woods. I screamed, fighting against their grip. I grabbed the leatherman from my pocket, the knife still out. I sliced my hand as I fumbled with it, but I fixed my grip and began slashing at the hands on my arms and thighs. They released, and I heard her screams mixed with pain, the anger now boiling red. I scrambled frantically. I heard her right behind me. No! And then I was in the clearing. I ran all the way to the buildings. My broken body couldn't comprehend that it could stop. My brain was unable to understand that it was safe. I just ran, 
thinking of running to the building. It was there. It wasn't always there, only sometimes, but it was there now. Maybe it would help. Coot said it could help. Another scream came. Cow! It was Maria, and I stopped. I heard footsteps from several directions. I looked and saw some of the counselors running my direction, all with looks of worry and panic. Cow! Maria yelled again from behind me. I turned and saw her running as well towards me. Her eyes widened as she got closer. Oh shit, Carl! Are you okay? Marcus, go get the medical kit! Marcus! A tall man with ebony skin nodded and then ran towards the mess hall. How long have I been gone? I asked through a throat that felt like sandpaper. It's only been two hours. Carl, are you okay? Maria asked, growing with concern. No, I mumbled. No, that can't be right. It's been days. I almost died. The screams. The world had started to go dim at the edges and I was losing my balance. I saw a figure in the woods behind Maria. Jeans and a red flannel shirt, both stained and torn. Auburn hair. I was falling. Shit! Grab him! Carl? Her voice was so far away. That was the last thing I remembered as a scream deafened out with the other noise. Silence and blackness followed. I woke up in my cabin. The bedding was stuck to my skin from sweat and I felt awful. Light filtered through the curtains. It was too bright and I winced from it. Someone to my side gasped. I turned to see Jessica sitting on the couch. You're awake, she said in a Texan drawl. Don't move. I'll be right back with Maria. Wait, I croaked, but she was gone in a blur of blonde hair and too much positivity. I found some water by my bed. I reached for it and found my right hand was bandaged and hurt to move. I reached over with my left instead and began chugging it. I had felt like I had been days since I had anything to drink, and the room temperature water was heavenly. I dropped the cup onto the nightstand and tried to sit up more. I had hurt like hell when I immediately gave up the effort. Maria came in a little while later. I expected her to look relieved, but she looked pissed. I opened my mouth to speak, but she cut me off. Don't you dare say a single word, Maria said as she stalked towards me. You have been unconscious for almost two days. You have a possible concussion, and not only did you split your stitches, but you managed to widen the wound even more. I was going to have Tuwit to take you down to the hospital, but he told us that the roads were closed. Now, apparently, there was a rock slide or something, and no one will be able to get up here for a while. Thankfully, he has some pretty serious antibiotics and painkillers from a surgery a while ago and has been letting us use them. It would serve you right if you lost your foot, but I don't think you will. Maria stood at the bedside now, glaring daggers at me. What the hell were you thinking? You were injured and not even supposed to be outside of your cabin. We could have handled the situation. No, you could. I'm not done. We could have handled it. You taught us what to do. We can handle the faceless. It's one of the creatures we know the most about from the CWAP. You have a stupid hero complex. I don't care what your reasoning behind it is. It's going to get you killed. Get your shit together and quit it with a self-sacrificing behavior. You won't be able to walk on your foot for much at all if you do anything else to it. Your lucky attendants still work. But if you try this shit again, if you go out of your way to try and be everyone's savior, I'll cut those tendons myself. Hmm. We held each other's gaze for an extended moment. I laughed nervously. You wouldn't do that. Maria pulled something out of her pocket and flicked at it. A blade appeared, which she put next to my foot. You want to test me? Where the hell did you get a switchblade? And she shrugged. I confiscated it from Meredith. The kid had a rough home life. I think she's from Nebraska. 
Regardless, do you understand? And I nodded. Good. Maria unswitched the blade. What are you going to be doing for the next couple of weeks? I'm going to be staying in my cabin. Maria nodded and sighed. <sighs> All right. She turned and made her way out the door. I'm sorry, I said. I... I have a hard time letting other people do things. It hasn't always worked out well in the past. Maria stopped. She turned around and studied me, looking to be questioning whether she should be asking something. And she decided it was all right. Does this have to do with that, Ruby? I felt like vomiting at the mention of the name. What? When you were out, you would yell about Ruby. Where are you, Ruby? I'm sorry, Ruby. Stuff like that. Maria looked at the floor. I assumed it was someone that you knew. Or maybe someone who got hurt? Yeah, I said quietly. Something like that. I didn't want to talk about this. After waiting for me to expound and not doing so, Maria seemed to understand that and nodded. All right then. She turned and opened the door. I'll make sure they send you lunch. I'll check in on your bandages later. Try to get some rest, okay? Sure, I said, given a smile she knew was fake. And she was gone. I was left alone in my cabin, stewing in my thoughts about what happened and what was happening around here. Thought about how I was in way over my head, how I shouldn't be in this position, how I knew I was stuck here, but I mostly thought about her. I thought about Ruby. But that wasn't doing much for my mental health. And so I decided to write down all of this and bottle all of that up and shove it way back where it won't see the light of day until my head is opened up against my will. Sure, it's not the best coping strategy, but I also don't want to lose my mind. And so I feel that with the given situation, it is a perfectly reasonable coping strategy. Anyways, that's all I have for right now. I'll be having my call with the owner on Wednesday. I'll update him on everything that's going on. And hopefully, we'll also be able to figure out more about this whole warning thing. Fingers crossed on that at least. I'll let you all know what I find out. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Another one. Wow. Wow. Absolutely chest-pounding, riveting and mysterious stuff there. That's got to be my favourite part so far in this uh, wonderful series. Big thank you to the author, Wanahi, for allowing me to narrate this incredible, incredible series. As ever, guys and girls, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear? and DMT's Cryptid Crew. As always, if you would like to pen the next big hit on the show, or just fancy having a crack at things, then please, please do send that over to my email, which is dmtforestafear at gmail.com. And I look forward to hearing from you. As always, guys, I hope you're all well and happy, family and friends alike. Keeping fit and focused, and above all, remember, be safe, not sorry.